Let's worship together. If you're in a place at home where you can uh, stand up, you might want to do that because music makes us move, right? Michael, lead us in some worship songs. God is our friend, and that's an awesome place to be. We are a friend of God. Is that amen? Amen. started this morning, your word tells us that you long to gather us to you as a mother hen, 
gathers her chicks under her wings. So finally this morning, Lord, we ask that you help us to lean into that image today and relish the idea that you will hold us, protect us, and provide for us. Let us praise you and worship you this morning, fully abandoning any emotions that might stand in our way. We pray now as your son taught us to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pastor Peyton, one of the pastors here at New Horizon United Methodist Church, and I get the distinct pleasure this morning to share with you some missions that are going on in this church and have been going since the beginning of COVID and even before then, and will continue until. But I want to ask you first, have you ever heard these words in your household? I'm so hungry. I'm going to die. You haven't fed me in forever. And then the next question is, when's the last time you ate? Five minutes ago. But I'm so hungry. So these were regular words in our household, and I'm pretty sure that they would happen again on any given time that both of my children are in the house, and maybe even when I'm looking in the fridge and just going, I'm so hungry. Well, the fact is that many in our community are hungry or our lives has changed to a point that what was a given may not be a given anymore. In fact, you know, just a few hours change in being how you're paid for work can change the food that you're able to afford. The fact that you may not be sure if you're going to be able to work next week or the next week or the following week can change what income you have coming in and just provide a stress level that you're not sure where your next meal is coming from. And that's sort of the position that we have here at New Horizon with Nourishing Lives is that we want to be a place of hope in the community. So here's what this means. It means that anyone who needs an extra meal or an extra hand or maybe just some food for the week is welcome to come and let us know. We have weekly bags on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and you can call the church office, find us on Facebook, send me a message and just say, hey, my family could use some help. And all we really need is a name, a phone number to make sure that we have the right information, and what your family looks like, how many adults, how many children. And all are welcome to receive. We also have grab-and-go meals every single day, Monday through Friday from 3 to 5. And those are for people to drive up with their kids, with their family, and get a meal that day. Those can be for anyone. Those can be for any child or any family that is looking for something for the day. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you need a break. Maybe homeschooling is driving you insane. Maybe the kids just need to get out of the house. We're here for that. That's what this hope is all about. When I think about those days that my kids would say, I'm so hungry, and I would say, have you eaten today? 
then you're not hungry. And I was reminded this morning, I follow a, a, a guy on Instagram that's, that his tag is, that's just Nick. And he goes around the country and places feeding children and doing mission work. And what he, he, his quote today that I just couldn't get out of my mind is, you can't tell a child that you fed them yesterday. You can't tell a family that you got to eat yesterday. We are about offering hope here. So here's what my ask is. If you need food, you need a break, you need some hope, we are here from you. But if you can offer food, you can offer hope, please help us out. So I have some meals here. These are my go-to parent meals. These are the days that I am too tired to make food. So it's really easy. It's pasta and sauce. You can open that up, maybe add some few veggies, it's good to go. Chili and rice is one of our family favorites. Or beans and rice, those always go well. There's the old standard mac and cheese. So many childhood memories in these boxes. And then I am known to eat peanut butter by the spoonful. So I got peanut butter and crackers. But here's what I thought. I wonder if when you shop this week, would you be willing to get these items, put them in a bag and tie them up, maybe put a note in there of that you're not alone or just some sort of encouragement, and we'll send those to a family this week. We serve about 100 families every week, and how cool would it be if your family could give directly to another family? I think this bag will cost about $15. It will go with other food because this is not all that we send home, but this is four meals. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Four meals and some snacks for a family. So if you would consider doing that, we have a box outside all the time. You can donate any food that you and your family enjoy. If you have a special meal that you really just like as a go-to meal, pack that up too. And each and every day of the week, we pack up meals for families. We get ready for Tuesday and Wednesday. But I would love if you could help us give some hope as well. Thank you so much. And remember, we're here. We're a place of hope. We're a place of food. And we're here to nourish lives. Hi again. <laughs> I'm Pastor Peyton. Um, thank you for hearing what we're doing with Nourishing Lives. It has truly been a blessing. But one of the things that is also a blessing is during this time of uncertainty, um, I think we all get a little anxious and we look for places of comfort. And one of the places of comfort in Scripture is the Psalms. Our Psalm today is Psalm 31, 1 to 5 and 15 to 18. And I'm going to be reading from um, the Common English Bible. I take refuge in you, Lord. Please never let me be put to shame. Rescue me by your righteousness. Listen closely to me. Deliver me quickly. Be a rock that protects me. Be a strong fortress that saves me. You are definitely my rock and my fortress. Guide me and lead me for the sake of your good name. Get me out of this net that's been set for me because you are my protective fortress. I entrust my spirit into your hands. You, Lord, God of faithfulness, you have saved me. My future is in your hands. Don't hand me over to my enemies, to all who are out to get me. Shine your face on your servant. Save me by your faithful love. Amen. I want to share with you today from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, this is one of the uh, letters of the uh, New Testament, one of the smaller books attributed to uh, Peter. And uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 speaks of these words of encouragement that... Um, bring us uh, uh, this hope and this encouragement of what God is doing and what God is building as something new is being uh, birthed all around them and for sure us today also. First Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 2 it says, instead like a newborn baby desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by it you will grow into salvation since you have tasted that the Lord is good, tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him as to a living stone, 
even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective, it is chosen, valuable. You yourselves are being built, built like living stones into a, a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus it is written in Scripture, Look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be shamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though, the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. This is a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall because they refuse to believe in the word. They stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You you have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Amen. Gracious and holy God, may we feel and sense your mercy. May we taste your goodness. May we smell the aroma of your grace. And may we hear and be nudged and feel your presence. Amen. And amen. I have to say that these are wonderful words of encouragement, aren't they? So that we are the chosen. We are the ones, you, you are chosen, you are blessed so that you can be a blessing. You are chosen and built up and, and made strong and good so that you can share the wonderful works of the Lord and share God's blessing. And you say, oh, no, 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 I can't do that, I can't do that, that's not me. There's other people who will do that, you know, other people who are leaders in the church, and, but no, it's all of us together because God is birthing something new. God is birthing something new in this story and certainly for us today. Something new is being born, and as it's being born, it's, it's built up, it's created, it's put together by the hand of God and then lifted and made something new. It's like when a mother gives birth, you know? There's a new birth. Every child that is born, uh, somebody has gone through the struggle and the pains of labor and been prepared for that moment, and here comes the wonderful and beautiful child and something new is born the church has certainly been born by god something created by god to bring hope to a hurting world and in the context where we find ourselves in the midst of the the safe at home quarantine and the covid and the covid that's going to stay with us and live with us into the foreseeable future the church is built for the purpose of hope built for the purpose of birthing something new as we begin to look at and step into the opening up process. There'll be hope. There'll be new life. I know as we watch the news, if you're like me, you're beginning to get hope that once again, I know that some of you are hoping like me that you can get a haircut one day, you know, you know that you can go get your massage or that you can can go to this place or that place that's been closed up for a while. We're, we've been hoping for the opening up, but there's something even bigger than that. Even when things open up, the worry, the anxiety, the illness, it's still with us. And people will be skeptical and people will be fearful and there'll be masks all around and there'll be new processes and procedures and doing this and doing that. And the world is going to look and feel different. And we've come to a time when the church is uniquely in a place to bring comfort, to bring hope, and to encourage the larger community 
as we rebuild lives and rebuild the economy and rebuild our society. You and me, we are the chosen. We are part of the answer for bringing hope and comfort and encouragement to the hurting and frightened in our society. You and me, we are the comfort for our communities as we move into this mysterious new future. And I know some of you are going to ask, well, what does that mean for the church? You know, we, we read the news, we watch the news, we, we listen to all that, but what does that mean for us? It means that as things open up as a church, we're going to have to relaunch. And I think the word is relaunch, not return. Because I don't think there's a returning to what we were before, no matter how much we may crave that. Everything that I read and look at and have been given by our denomination, things that I've been reading and research about what the church will be, that a new church is being born. And that's going to take new means, new ways, new processes of doing and being the church as we relaunch. Because returning to the old ways with just a, a mask and a baby wipe and thinking everything's going to be okay, it's just not going to be okay. There's still going to be fear. There's still going to be anxiety. To return to the old ways may actually be dangerous and unloving. Might even just be malpractice as a church. We will be living with COVID for a while. And we are not in a place of let's wait till it's over and then just pick up where we left off. We are in a place of relaunching as things open up as a church. And let's remember that the, the first rule, the first guideline, the first rule of our Methodist heritage is first do no harm. And so that's what we'll be around first and foremost is doing no harm and not returning to some processes and ways that may be harmful in the new future, but a relaunching, more like starting a new church. And here's the thing. You and me, we're chosen for this. We are chosen for this. Oh, I just want to go back to the way things were. We were chosen for the new day that's coming. God is building something in us laying the foundation and the, the cornerstone, the capstone in Jesus Christ, and using us as, as living stones to build something new and alive and to launch something that the world may never have known and seen before, but it is appropriate for this time and this place. You are chosen for this. You and me, we are the church, the community of faith, for just such a time as this. And you and me, we are the building block. We are the building blocks. And here's the thing, folks. The faith community in the history of the way things go, we're not the first to have to face this and do this. There are times that have happened throughout history that have altered the life of the faithful, the life of the community, the life of the society. And in those crucible moments, the faithful, the followers of Christ, the children of God, have showed the way forward, have lived into the new world that was being created, have risked and sacrificed for what is to come. And so, folks, you, any of you all who know me, you know that there's always a History Channel moment, it seems like. And so strap on, because we're going to walk through a little bit of history of how new worlds have begun and the faithful were chosen and and chosen and gifted and graced just for that moment. The minute that I say we're chosen for just as time as this, some folks might think of the story of Esther. Esther, in a world of oppression and genocide, a world of exile, a world of, of pain and, and international relations that were at war. And Esther found herself, along with extended members of her family, they were in a particular place to to see and understand, and she was in a place to step forward to the king and speak a word of, of change for the society. And it happened. 
it happened and, and the world changed and the way relationships between nations and peoples changed because God's chosen stepped up and stepped forward. The story of Noah that many of us know and we teach our kids, it's about birthing a new life. Birthing a new life. A world had become selfish and self-interested and, and there had been separation and brokenness and then there's this baptism of water that washes everything clean and Noah and his family are the birth of new life. And something is born anew and the faithful of God are chosen specifically for that new that is being born and coming. The story of Moses and the people of Israel. I know from our point of view, from our worldview, we look at it and say, well, slavery is bad and freedom is good. And so this is a good story of moving from slavery to freedom. But for those people, they knew no other life. They knew no other life. They knew no other place. And yet as a nation, as a people, they got up and moved not for their blessing, but for the blessing of the generation and the generations to follow. They only knew one way of life, but now they're birthing something more. The story of Moses is so much more than just the physical movement of a people, but it's about the sacrifice to establish a new life, new society, new economics, new ways of worship, new ways of, of being the faithful community and stepping forward. Some of my favorite stories of the Old Testament Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah were the leaders bringing people back after a time of exile to establish a new world, establish a new community, establish a new society. And they laid the foundation for the temple, for the church, and how the church would be. And when they laid that foundation, the older folks, the senior folks who remembered the old temple began to weep because it wasn't going to be like it was before. But the next generation began to cheer and to celebrate and to dance because they saw a future with hope. It was going to be new, it was going to be different, and God was giving birth to something new. We are the ones chosen for just such a time. I know what you're saying, Rafe, those are all Old Testament stories. Well, then go to the New Testament. Stephen and Peter and, and those establishing this, this faith of Christianity they were sacrificing themselves to bring justice and love and caring for people. Stephen, who we think of as oh, the first martyr, the first one to die, you know what his job was? His job was feeding orphans and widows. He was feeding families that in their time and in their setting were without. He was collecting food from those who have and making sure that orphans and widows and families got food and were cared for and, and got encouragement. Does it sound like something you may have heard of a church or two doing around here? And he becomes the first martyr. And the followers like, like Stephen and Peter become about relaunching what it is to be a community of faith. It becomes inclusive of all, even the Gentiles, even those who think and act differently and live differently. No longer were they going to be a group of Jewish people following old patterns and old ways and old traditions and learning from this rabbi named Jesus, but now they would be Christians, launching new communities and new ways of sharing their faith, new ways of doing and being the church. And then we march on beyond the biblical times and throughout history we have seen times when the church has stepped up to birth something new after epidemics and after pandemics and after wars. The church literally was built on the bones of the saints that have gone before them. And when I say literally, I mean that before the Reformation, before the you know, time of enlightenment, there was this abbeys and monasteries and cathedrals were literally built on the places where saints were buried and on their bones. St. Peter's Basilica is the place where we believe that Peter had been buried. There is a church of St. Peter and St. Paul in Bath, England 
that literally its foundation is bones of saints that were buried in a certain place and then the church was built on top of it. This was the common practice for centuries where the, the monasteries and the cathedrals were built for everybody to rally to and everybody to come to. And for the early centuries, this is the way that they did church because they believed that the dead saints that were there and part of the building would help forward their prayers to God. And then there was a reformation. Well, there were plagues, and there was hardship, and there were wars, and there were battles, and the, the new birth out of that dark time was a reformation. And the reformation came with no longer was the intercession of saints needed for prayer, but you had direct access to God. There was no need to be near the dead and on top of their bones. So the places of worship began to happen everywhere. And there became the concept of the priesthood of all believers, where everybody was chosen. Everybody became the stone on which God was going to build something new. And so something new was born. The reformed denominations of the church that moved through the next centuries. And even Methodism, our own Methodist church, was born out of a sense of relaunching what it meant to be a community of faith, born out of a relaunch of the Church of England, because the Church of England had, had sent people to uh, begin to work in these United States. But there was a conflict. There were wars that happened. Revolutions. And so the new church that was birthed out of this to care for people in the midst of that conflict and to follow the pioneers as they went into the frontier was this movement of Methodists. It birthed something new, not confined to church buildings, but happening in people's homes. Not one big building that everybody rallied to, but happening in people's homes to provide community, to share faith, to support and security and to, to support and encourage. Now, you know me, I could probably just keep marching through history and give you story after story after story of how God works in relaunching the community of faith. And now we find ourselves in a crucible moment. Literally, the church has drastically changed and shifted overnight. What we had been doing was closed off. And what lays ahead? I'm not really sure. But here's what I do know. We are God's people. You and I. We are the chosen for this purpose, to relaunch a church that becomes a blessing that becomes a blessing for others, that becomes community for people that are losing their sense of community because we've been safe at home, that becomes comfort for those who feel anxiety, that becomes hope for those who feel desolate and lost and maybe even physically hungry. We are chosen for this. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people of God. We are a people possessed by the Holy Spirit for birthing something new. And those of you who are saying, oh, I can't wait to see what you all do. It's not about seeing what you all do. It's about all of us together by the grace of God. And yes, it will be extremely dangerous and disconcerting. But it will also be hope-filled. And we are the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people of God, possessed by the Spirit. We are the ones that are chosen so that you and I, together as the community of faith, can share the wonderful works that God is doing and moving in our lives so that we can be witnesses about the movement from darkness to light because that's what God does, because that is what's going to happen in the days ahead. And we get to be the building blocks for that. You are chosen. You are worthy. 
you are valuable. And we, together, are that community of faith that brings hope and blessing. Amen and amen. Most gracious God, we thank you for the signs of hope and blessing that we see all around us. We thank you for the good news that we see all around us in the world. We thank you that you have chosen us, but now we need your grace to make us worthy. Amen. And amen. I want to invite you and offer you the reminder to uh, respond to, uh, to God's goodness and blessing in your lives as you are able. Um, use the uh, formats on the, uh, on the website and on the um, uh, texting to give opportunities that we have. I'm sure that the links are included in this. But take those moments and respond and, and, and give. Know that we are birthing something new, and as we birth something new, we're always you know, changing and upgrading and working with the technology, and we still need funding for that technology that's growing. Hopefully the sound was a lot better this time. Um, we've done some things along those lines, but we could use special gifts if you're able to help with that technology. But please do respond in a way of giving, and please do respond in a way of serving and sacrificing that, uh, as you can so that we can all together be about bringing hope to our community. Let's uh, share together as we worship through song.
Thank you for joining us in worship. Go now lifted and chosen and blessed by God. Go now with the gift of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit going with you and encouraging you. Amen and amen.